Hi everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to a video I've been wanting to do for a long time and I feel like it's gotten a resurgence lately. I saw Joshana just did this um, and I thought that was so funny and I've seen tons of people do this both in romance and in fantasy and I have kind of a mix of both. Um, so by the title, if you don't know what this video means, I'll explain it. Basically, uh, you take your favorite books, books that are five stars for you, books that mean a lot to you, and then you go on Goodreads and you look up one star reviews for them. And then I read them and I cry or bitch back. So I'm feeling a little spicy today. I've just, it's been a lot. I've been like dealing with some crabby customers on my eBay today and I'm just like, you know what, I want to bitch a little bit because I don't really make too many rant videos anymore. Um, I never did make a ton of them, but this I feel like is fun because I'm like fighting against the ranting. Um, and so I picked five books. They're all um, favorites in their area for me. Um, some of them are childhood favorites and some of them are new favorites. And I'm going to go through and do two or three. It depends on the content we get here. I've tried not to read these ahead of time. There's one of them I saw because the next page took too long to load. But I have all of the pages loaded up on my computer and I'll pull that up. I made myself a cocktail here. I have a diet vodka cranberry. I was just, you know, got some mood lighting. I was just feeling it. So we're going to do this. And these are the books we're going to do. We're going to do Outlander because I have to. Also check out this beautiful new copy. I got it. The first four books in the series had this like cool like banded top to it. I'm still looking for a copy of Cross Stitch by the way. I want one of those super bad. Um, but I have Drums of Autumn with this banded and so I'm still looking for a couple. But um, you know I need all the copies of Outlander. So we're going to read some one star reviews of this. Then for another romance I have Lord of Scoundrels. This is one of my favorite historical romances that I've read this year. Um, I know that the Bridgertons have some reasonable uh, issues with them. So I don't want to do that because again I like understand people's issues with it. This is a book like I feel like it was amazing and progressive for like when it came out and still because I read it for the first time just a couple months ago and I was just like, wow, what the hell? So I'm going to read some one star reviews of this. There's a step back if you want to see it. Then I have um, Crescent City, which I just read this month and I loved it. I adored this book. I'm so glad it got picked as our buddy read for this month. And so this is a new favorite, a newer book. It only came out in March. I want to read some of the one-star reviews for this and see what people's critiques are because if they made it through the whole book, I just don't understand your critiques because it was so well-crafted. I don't understand. Then I have a favorite from Booktube and that's Illuminate. I read this series because of booktube and I'm so thankful it is one of my favorite series of all time it is fantastic this is a YA series and it's still like is right up there with my favorite series romance included I love it and I already know what some of the criticism for this one will be and I want to bitch about it and say why they're wrong so that's why I picked that one and then I have to do my childhood favorite this is still my favorite book of all time it works best as a standalone. A sequel came out for this book and it's shit. It's shit. So, mm. but it's East. This is the UK beautiful like puff cover copy with like a map inside. So it says North Child. That's the name of it in other places, but it's East by Edith Patel. So we're going to do this. And boy, are we ready to get sassy? Because this is going to be great. Look, I got my like, this is one of my, um, whiskey glasses I use when I watch Outlander so I thought it would be fitting and I just like I can't do whiskey I just can't and I don't want to because it's kind of early in the day but I did make myself you know the vodka cranberry and I thought it'd be fun so let's go okay okay so so Outlander all right this has 815,000 ratings and 45,000 reviews, which makes sense. It's over 
30 years old at this point. It's going to have a lot of reviews. Um, and yeah, so I went to the, I went to the reviews. This has an overall rating of 4.23. So just think of that for having 815,000 reviews to still have a 4.23 rating. It's doing pretty good, doing pretty good. So let's go ahead and read this first one here. Here we go. All right, I gave up on this book because I was sustaining permanent damage from reading it and I was afraid I'd start hitting back. And it's a borrowed copy, so that wasn't cool. In fairness, I should say there's a lot of good writing here. Uh, yeah, there is. I really enjoyed the beginning chapters. They even kind of cracked me up because I have friends who love genealogy and their husbands always get that look when they start talking about it. And that's exactly how I imagine Claire looking when her husband Frank started droning on and on about his ancestors. Okay, okay. This is a really long review. So let's skip down a little ways. Oh my gosh. There was this scene where big kilted oaf, I mean Jamie, starts laughing about the whole beating thing and reminiscing about how hot she looked when he was holding her down and beating the crap out of her, and she forgives him for that too. And like instantly, I'm all, who am I and what am I doing here? Yeah, that's true. And I still staggered on. Heaven only knows why. And how did the author reward me for my perseverance? What is this book all about? What's the reoccurring literary theme? Here it goes. Here we go. Rape. Attempted rape, more attempted rape, marital rape, a little more marital rape, conversations about rape, giggling during conversations about rape, and I'm all, I'm out of here, and I don't care how many of my friends hate me. I read 444 pages in a row, plus I skimmed a lot of the rest, including the creepiest, rapiest Chekhov's gun I've ever seen fired. Do not tell me I didn't give this book a fair chance. I totally did. Ooh, Ooh, her number one reason for having a problem with this. It's a bummer for the woman involved, but save your sympathy for her brother, assuming you have any emotional response at all, which you won't if you're Claire. Ouch. If this book works for you, fine. I'm not here to judge. I'm just asking that you understand how completely creeped out I was by all this and not tell me I didn't give it a fair chance. I did. I really hate not finishing a book once I started and I just couldn't stand it anymore. Owie. That hurts me. Okay, let's find one that's not so long. Okay, here's a funny one. Um, this one's not too long. Um, this one said that they DNF'd it though, but it's still kind of funny what they said. So here we go. Here, I'm gonna write, rewrite the scene that ruined this book for me, okay? It's always the same scene, guys, come on. Maybe I'm just coming at this from a more like, <laughs> I like BDSM books, you guys know this. But if you're gonna hold everything about Jamie against him because of the spanking scene, which he apologizes for and promises never for the rest of their marriage will he ever use punishment as a way to correct her behavior again, even though he's a 22-year-old man who that's the only way that he's seen marital discipline work ever. And then when he communicates with his wife, they discuss it and is like, hey, that's not gonna be the best way to work out issues with me. And if you ever do it again, I'm gonna stab you. And he even says, you have the go ahead to stab me if I ever raise a hand to you in anger again. Then I think you're missing the lesson that Diana is trying to say. She's saying, hey, this is how it worked. And it's not gonna work for them that way. And there is times later on throughout the series where Claire wishes Jamie would beat her so that he could get out his anger. Wait, that sounds wrong. So that she could ask forgiveness for something she's done wrong that messed up. And he's like, I promise I won't do it. You're just going to have to live with the guilt of this. And it comes back to that scene where as a 22 year old, he promised he would never do that again. He's 22 years old. You try getting married at 22 and being pressured by everyone around you that that's the way that it's supposed to be. And then decide, you know, oh, I can have the high ground here. I just... I don't know. Okay, but anyway, back to this review. I knew it would get me feisty. Here we go. Anyway, here, I'm going to rewrite the scene that ruined it for me. Jamie, son of High some Highlander from the 1740s. Claire, you didn't listen to what I said. You disobeyed me, your husband. You risked everyone's lives, and I'm going to punish you for your misbehavior. Yes, I know the evil man abused you and nearly raped you, but that was your own fault. I love you. I really do. I don't enjoy this, but people expect me to give you the punishment you deserve. Claire, an educated woman from the 1940s. 
Jamie, first of all, rape is never the victim's fault. And now you better listen because I'm going to say this just once. If you ever raise a hand against me, if you ever hurt me, I will. And I promise this, I will make this marriage a living hell for you. From now on until the bitter end, I swear to God, you will regret it. Jamie, some Highlander from the 1740s who knows better than to disrespect his wife. You're right, Claire. I'm very sorry. Forgive me. Yep. Since that is not what happened, it took all the fun out of it for me. I won't be able to continue this book and forget about what happened. I don't like the way this relationship is portrayed as a healthy one or how Jamie is a man and a husband that teenage girls and women swoon over. We should all know better than this. Ooh, bitch, you're wrong. You're fucking wrong. Okay, there we go. That was a spicy one. Wow, one person's review was a DNF and it just said, what the actual fuck? Classy. Classy. That's a good one. Let's see. Someone just said, whatever, it sucked. And they're throwing it into the trash can. All right. Mm. Yeah. All right. That's enough of this one. I'm just getting pissed. Which was the point? It's the point. So, yeah, I'm not really surprised at all. It all is coming to what people either perceive as consent issues or there being too much rape in her books. Um, the first thing that I'll say, I think Diana's very clear when things are acceptable and when they are not. Um, there are plenty of times during the book where Claire will say no. Um, and then there are lots of times where because physical touch is the main way that these two communicate and whenever they're not having sex with each other, I don't mean like whenever they're not having sex. I mean, whenever there are times in their marriage where they're like not physical together is when the most issues arise because they connect on a basic physical level before anything else. And times where like rape by someone else messes their relationship are the most difficult times for them as it would be. And I think that people miss out as well on the crazy, amazing representation of male rape that happens in this book and how a trauma survivor who's a man, how he, when his entire identity is his masculinity, whether that's right or wrong, okay, whether he's right or wrong, because there's plenty of men that it is, and you can't just say, get over your masculinity, because that's not how it works. That's not how it works. You don't just say, get over it, when you are raised in that culture and you know nothing else. Like, that's very insensitive and dumb to say, just get over it. And it's fiction, okay? We don't have therapists. We don't have people to help. This is a fictional historical novel, okay? There's not. And Claire uses every bit of knowledge and um, information she has from her time as possible to help them. And when she goes through it later on in her life, she has to take that same advice, you know, and see if it works or not. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Oh my gosh, someone just said, ladies, we need to talk. We need to talk about what I just read. All right, moving on, moving on. I was going to put these books up here as I did them. We'll do that. Let's move on to Lord of Scoundrels because that one I'm excited to see. Here we go. So if you don't know, okay, here's one that isn't too long. If you don't know what this one is about, because it's not as famous as Outlander is, Lord of Scoundrels is about a woman named Jessica who's basically seen as a spinster at this point. She goes to Paris to get her brother back, who's her younger brother, but is the heir to the family. Um, she's a very smart, put together, wise woman. And she comes up against Dane, who is, I think he is the, Mar the Marquis of Dane, um, Sebastian, which we never call him Sebastian, we always call him Dane, um, who is kind of the influencer, the influencer of the time, and her brother is following after him like a puppy, and Jessica comes to town and asks Dane, hey, please help me get my brother back home because he is wasting all our money and he's being an idiot, and Dane, because he's so attracted to Jessica and also is just kind of like, 
He's like, screw you. I'm going to make things as difficult for you as possible. He's kind of a jerk. But Jessica goes forth to outmaneuver him at every possible point. And the two end up married to each other. And it's amazing. And Jessica is very communicative with Dane, even when he's not good at it. And it was just amazing. I loved it. It was very well thought out for a historical novel. And it has some amazing stuff in it. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm going to read a one star review for this one. Here we go. This. I wanted to love it. I was told over and over again how awesome it was. Like flowers from the storm, they said. They lied. This was nothing like flowers. I don't know what that book is. So reading this book was like listening to bad black metal. It was like expecting the majesty, atmosphere, and emotion of Limbotics Arts Moon in the Scorpio only to get a bad cradle of fifth ripoff instead. Okay. I'm not smart enough to know this shit and that person's trying to be too smart, whatever. I was told that this was the book to give non-romance readers who were curious about the genre. No, this book reads like a parody of the romance genre. It's every, it has every kitschy I can th think of in a romance and flat characters as well. Ooh, wrong, so wrong. That just makes, I'm offended. A heroine who's smart, beautiful, witty, and has many, many marriage proposals and won't marry for some reason and doesn't fit the era the book takes in, the readers do not understand. A hero who's tortured by things that happened many years ago and can only be changed by the power of love. The constant bickering between hero and heroine that eventually leads to love because all those arguments hid what they really were feeling. This was awful. I gave it 98 pages and gave up when Jessica shot Dane. She shot him with a pistol. Pistols from that time period were well known for misfiring, so he's lucky to be hit in the arm. And he was certain to have an infection, and this is treated as funny and empowering to women. I just can't. Then there was the language anachronisms. I counted at least 14 obvious ones in the pages I read. Just didn't fit the time frame at all. I know the reader was supposed to admire her, but I didn't. She struck me as a selfish, judgmental twat who didn't give a damn what others thought of her. The hero, Dane, was a childish brat who knew he was acting like a child but wouldn't change his ways. I did not feel sorry for him in the least. They deserve each other. Wow. Okay, that's one way to go. That's one way to go. Did not agree with that. Let's see. All right, here's another one. This entire book is pretty stupid. <laughs> the characters are flat and superficial and act totally brainlessly. The heroine is a superwoman, beautiful, IQ at least 200, good at sports and a virgin at the age of 27. Willingly single, of course, but with six marriage proposals a year. I certainly don't have to explain how it really looked if a woman refused to marry in those times. The family would force her without any hesitation, but no, this one wants to remain independent, huh? Okay, there's an answer to this. The answer is that Jessica has a, I think it's her aunt or her grandmother, not sure which, I can't remember right now, who makes it so she can do that. Jessica has a lot of um, cousins that she's been taking care of them. She's been being kind of like their nurse or nanny for the last like how many years. And so they were perfectly happy for her to remain unmarried because they were basically getting free childcare from her. So they weren't pushing her to marry because she was being um, like, they just weren't making her do it. And she is of a high enough social class that no one was pushing her to do it because she already had other family members who were. And also she was older than her younger brother and her younger brother is the only like, you know, he's the head of the family right now since she doesn't have her parents and he wasn't making her get married. So therefore there's no one making her get married. And so if she didn't like the people proposing to her, she didn't do it. And then what I hated about Dane was his oversensitiveness. He frequently suffered from headaches and generally was somehow too female. And the most unbelievable thing, he underestimated himself in terms of taking her virginity. What if she will not like it? What if she will run away? I'm such a beast. No man ever would think in this way. Why for heaven's sake did the author think he was devilish Beelzebub? Part of me. Um, I don't quite know what they're talking about about that. Him word she wasn't like it is because he's hiding from himself the fact that he loves her at this point and he's afraid that he'll do it wrong because he's never been with a virgin before and because 
her opinion and her love means more to him than all the other women that he's been with, he's afraid of messing it up with the one person he really cares about. I don't think that that's ridiculous at all. Why these two became a couple is a mystery to me, except sexual attraction. They argued all the time, which is far from anything like harmony and love, and had really nothing in common. Okay, well, this person obviously doesn't love banter, because the first thing about Jessica that gets Dane is that she just will take no crap, and she always will volley back and forth with him, and she's always, like, one step ahead of him. And it drives him crazy, because he's never one step behind anybody. So... You're missing the point of this. Plus some other details that don't fit for the 1800s, such as dyed hair, dental drills, parking of carriages, secretaries, and so on. I wouldn't say a word if the author decided to put the story in the 20th century, but not the 19th. Please, one of the worst books I've ever read. A waste of time. Well, madam, good thing we don't give a fuck what you think. All right, moving on, let's go to Illuminae. I hope this is entertaining to you. It's just me looking through these and reading, but that's what these always are. I don't know. That a waste of time. That just, please. All right, Illuminae. All right, this one has a lot of swearing in it, so be prepared, my people who don't like swearing. I know some of you don't. All right, this one was a DNF at 60% for Illuminae, and they said, I can't fucking read this anymore. I hate this book. I hate this format. I hate these characters. I hate the humor. I hate the stupid ass, sarcastic, unfunny humor. I hate the fact that the humor makes me so angry. I hate the fact that the humor seemed like it was written by a 50 year old trying to write as a 17 year old. I hate the plot. I hate the story. I hate the format. That's another one. I hate the weird ass sci-fi words. I will agree with that. Kristoff has always made up swear words and it's kind of annoying, but he's not the only one who does that. So I will give you that. I hate that I don't know what is going on. I don't even know what I don't know. I hate everyone for recommending this to me. I hate the format so much. I hate that I thought giving this book another chance would be nice. I hate that I was wrong. I hate that my friends knew I would hate this. I hate that I didn't listen. I hate that I bought the rest of the series already. I hate that I thought I would love it. I hate that I was obviously wrong. I hate this book. I hate that I want nothing more than to throw it in the trash. I hate that this is an unpopular opinion. I hate that I want to punch myself for thinking I'd like this book. I hate everything about this book. I hate that it's sitting on my shelf. I hate that I just want it out of my sight. I hate that everyone's going to comment on this review asking, OMG, how can you not like this? I hate that I have to tell them that I think this book is shit. Bye. <laughs> you have some anger issues. I'm sorry. But you should have listened to it. All right. Mm, too long. Too long. This one's funny. They put a funny picture, current mood, and this is what it says. Ugh, I'm just going to end my suffering. This is a great book to look at. The format is so visually appealing, and each page brings something different. It's truly a work of art. Its storytelling ability, however, sucks. It's dialogue heavy and comes with info dumps in the form of Wikipedia-like pages. The romance is generic and actually had me rolling my eyes. Me, eye rolling. Romance. It's unnatural, honestly. In the end, I had to look within myself and ask, do I give one shit about what's happening right now? Would I care if they all got blasted into space and the human species ended? Because if the answer is no, then I think I know what has to be done. DNF at 43%. So, man, I will say, guys, this is the best if you listen to it, all right? That's why when I suggest this book, I give heavy, heavy caveat that if you don't like to listen to books, then this might not be the book for you because I tried reading it three times before I gave in and purchased it on the audiobook and I did a dual reading experience and it made this book go from a three star to a six plus for me because it is a full cast audio, there is sound effects, there is um, action, there is the cre there is spooky crap in this book that if you don't listen to it on audio, you miss out on it completely. Like I had started listening to this with one of my best friends and then I forgot to warn her about a certain part, the little birdie part, if you've listened to it. And she was home 
listening to this in bed as she was falling asleep and she messaged me at 1 a.m. and she's like, what the fuck, Jen? Little Birdie, and she sends me the SpongeBob meme where he's like running and I was like, oh, sorry, forgot to warn you. Like, you gotta listen to these, which I understand that it's not fair of an author to say that, but sometimes it is. If it's gonna make the experience better, you gotta do it. Hmm. All right, here's a short one. This was not good. I thought the setting and the overall plot were really interesting, and I appreciated that the authors were trying to do the form with the format, but any enjoyment I got out of things was completely overshadowed by my hatred of the characters, the dialogue, and the romance. Ouch. Here's another short one. Whilst I like the idea of this book, there was way too much info dumping and none of it was ever explained. It had potential, but sadly, it wasn't for me. So I will say with that, that the info dumping is just necessary for this kind of a book because to set up what was happening on the world, off the world, in the different parts of the world, it all comes together through this series. But I can understand if you don't like info dumping, but I feel like with sci-fi and fantasy to some extent you are just going to have that happen like there's not a way around it all right here's one I'll read one more this book was really disappointing for me it was just so hard to get into I blame the format for that I like the idea of the format but it just made it really hard to read although the format meant we didn't really get to connect with the characters as we were only getting to know them through their communications with others this book had so much buzz around it but unlike others this book did not rise to my expectations. So that again just comes for me of like not connecting with the characters. I think if you listen to it, you'll connect with the characters because they have their own voice and I fall in love with them with the inflection of their voice. And I really cared if they were gonna live or die. But if you don't care that, then of course you're just like, what is this shit? So what can I say? All right, let's do East real quick. This one I'm nervous about. I mean, with the other three, I like knew what could be wrong with it. But East has been my favorite book since I was 13 years old. So I'm a bit nervous about what the bitchy people are going to say. But I'm a big girl. So let's see what we got for this one. Random. Okay, 1.5 stars. Parts I really liked Parts of it I really liked the idea of, but they were never worked out like I wanted them. Maybe I had too high expectations in how well the writer would use the Norwegian fairy tale that this book is based on. Overall, I think the biggest problem for me is that I did not connect to any of the characters. So that might be fair. Um, I don't know. So this book is in uh, five different points of view. And... So they're very like, besides Rose's chapters, everyone else's are really short. So I could understand that, but I love Rose. She's one of my favorite protagonists. She's one of my favorite heroines. And I love this book because of her and that she is a young girl who becomes a woman who, who makes right her wrongs. And I love that about her. So I don't agree with that. All right, here's a shortish one. Here we go. If you don't read East by Edith Patel, you're not missing out on anything. <laughs> Ouch. But I mean, that's the truth about a lot of books. Like if they're not your book then you're not missing out on anything. I don't know, here we go. I knew I wouldn't like it by page 25, but I kept at it anyway. I even followed my 50th page rule, the one where giving a book a fair chance means reading 50 pages in, then deciding if I wanna stop reading, but I kept reading to the end. Well, you could have stuck by your rule, then I wouldn't have to read this shitty review. East is a retelling of the fairy tale, East of the Sun and West of the Moon. It is written in first person, but the views alternate between Rose, Nettie, Rose's older brother, Father, Rose's father, Troll Queen, and White Bear. I don't have a point of view preference, so I don't mind the alternating viewpoints. 
All right. The main character, Rose, was so foolish the majority of the time, it made me want to pull my hair out. Her foolishness seemed to class with her admirable intelligence, which I don't understand. I don't understand how in one instance a person can set a character up as having quick wit and then in the next make the character foolish. I just don't get it. So I agree with part of that. But part of it is, is it's a spell that's cast. And if you were sleeping beside someone in a bed that you don't know who it is, and you all of a sudden have a way to look at who you've been sharing a bed with for almost a year, I feel like you would do it. Like, she doesn't know that she's not supposed to tell. She isn't told to wait. I think that's different. Like, it's different than... Like Beauty and the Beast, where Belle is told not to go to the east wing, west wing, whatever wing it is, and then goes there. Rose isn't told she can't look at this person. She just has a feeling that maybe she shouldn't. And then she gets given the opportunity to look. And the point is, is that human nature is naturally curious. And we would all probably make that mistake if we were put in that place. And so I don't think that that makes Rose wrong or stupid or foolish for doing that personal opinion there um the climax was anything but that i'm itching to sarcastically tell you the climax but i can't because you may want to read it <laughs> east was too long worse yet it felt like east had no substance it's hard to describe but i'll try in east the narrators tell you this happened then this happened then this happened the end no moral no value nothing and what the H is all of the Stockholm Syndrome fairy tales. Beauty and the Beast, anyone? Stockholm Syndrome does not equal romantic. Um, I wouldn't even agree that this one is that because Rose stays pretty snappy the whole time. And when she first goes to save the white bear, it's because she just wants to do right by him because she knows he's taken by someone evil. It's not because she has Stockholm Syndrome to him. She doesn't even think that she loves him yet. She grows to love him on her journey, not just because he had held her captive. And Stockholm Syndrome is when you take on the attributes of the person who kidnapped you. It does not just mean because you fall in love with someone who captured you. You can call that brainwashing if you want, but it's not Stockholm Syndrome. In fact, the people who had Stockholm Syndrome they didn't necessarily love the people who kidnapped them. They just had become kind of brainwashed. And then it made them, you know, it made them take on the attributes of their captors. It doesn't make you automatically love the person. So people always throw Stockholm Syndrome around as like, that's what it is. Look up what Stockholm Syndrome actually is, okay? It's based on a specific incident. Anyway, sorry. Just got a bitch about that. Um, lots of people saying it's boring. I will say that it is a slow roll. So I understand if people might think it's boring because this is a very like peaceful, relaxing story. Um, it isn't all action and adventure. And one thing I was going to comment on too, the person who said the characters say this happened, then this happened, then this happened. The context of the book is that a child finds some articles of clothing and implements from this journey that Rose went on, finds it in the attic, and then finds a book where all the people involved had put in their experiences into this book. And so it's the case of like you're reading the book about it. So when the people are like telling what happened, it's because they're reading a storybook. That's why that's happened. So, um, Again, this one is just a lot of people saying that it's boring, and that's fair. This is a very slow-moving fairy tale, and it's not going to be for everybody. Um, but it's my favorite, because maybe it's because I read it so young. In fact, I'm sure it's because I read it so young, and it's just whimsical to me, and I love that about it. And even people that I've got to read it as an adult, they have felt the same way, that it was like a brush of fresh air and just like beautiful like that so there's that all right let's move on to crescent city so this is house of house of earth and blood crescent city book one let's look at the one star reviews let me pull these up all right so this book here we go here's one this one they just have series predictions 
is what they did. Here we go. Badass heroine. She's so special. So beautiful. Everyone is in love with her. Love interest number one is introduced. But wait. Faye. Oh, sorry. It's Sidhi now, I guess. Love interest number two introduced. Gross alpha male. Totally Sidhi. <laughs> Something about a mate bond. Shows abusive tendencies towards MC, but that's okay because he has a troubled past and all transgressions are forgiven. As a matter of fact, those abusive actions are portrayed as swoonworthy and hashtag relationship goals. Original plot lines and character forgotten. LOL, what's continuity? Love interest number one is forgotten. Probably won't show up again. Okay, so this isn't someone who actually read the book because they put this up in May 2018 and they are just making predictions. So fuck you. You didn't read the book and... None of those are really true. So I'm not going to finish that. I'm going to move along. You're here because you're probably going through the one star reviews flabbergasted at how somebody could possibly rate an SJM book one star. <laughs> okay. Cheers to this person for knowing why we're here. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Before it's released, I'm planning on writing my review because how dare I? I'm literally destroying her entire perfect book and I spur only hatred from my mouth and I should invest my time into something else. Okay, Boomer. The amount of time I've responded to such comments and now I'm tired with it. Anywho, I read the first five chapters online and oh boy, first of all, I'm not planning on reading the rest of the book. So based on my chapter five read, I'm making my decision now because I'm that type of person. Okay, we're skipping you, even though you tried to be cool. You tried to be cool, and then you said you didn't finish it. Can we have someone who finished it? Okay, here's one. Lo and behold, the final nail in the I just don't think urban fantasy is for me coffin. Fair, fair. That's something that held me back from reading this book. I don't like urban fantasy really at all. I've only read one series that's urban fantasy, and I wasn't a huge fan of it. So much cringe from the awful snarky banter dialogue to the early 2000s fan fiction-esque obsession with needlessly describing minutia like the trivial details of the characters' outfits in every scene. Yikes. Also, OMG, why is this book so long? Where was the editor? I'm especially curious as to their actual existence when I see SJM rooting through her previous books and reusing her own writing, not just certain terms, but some nearly word-for-word -word lines. Is it still plagiarism if you're both the perpetrator and the victim? No, because it's your book. Akatar, do I look like I'm part of the spring court? The words were tinged with an arrogance that only an immortal could achieve. House of Earth and Blood, Connor merely said with an unwavering arrogance that only an immortal predator could achieve. You want me, I want you. Yeah, because he's sexy as hell. Anyway, I'm only blaming myself for not DNFing this cringy behemoth immediately. I'm never one for hate, reading a book that I'm clearly not enjoying, so I'm not sure how or why I managed to finish this book. Lesson learned. I'm not really sure what they mean by this. I will agree some of the banter was overdone in this book. That was something that I noticed when I was listening to it as well. But to me, <laughs> this will be so weird. Bryce has so much chip on her shoulder, like just all the chips on her shoulder. And in the beginning, it feels like that is just like over, like she doesn't need to have that much chips on her shoulder. And then as more and more is revealed about her, I feel like I understand why she is like she is. So it worked for me. Um, also, yeah, it is urban fantasy and still has like fake courts. I like that. I really enjoyed it and what I would love because you know there's that secret feeling that we think the Throne of Glass series and the actor series are connected somehow I would love if this series was like a couple thousand years ahead of that even like that would be amazing if they were connected that way I would love that DNF chapter seven this was awful between the excessive use of the terms male and female, the useless slut shaming, and the LOL so edgy drug use, I can't do it. I can't handle characters constantly baring their teeth and losing breaths. I also heard that there was rep in this book, but I don't see it. It wasn't significant. I am angry. I wasted my money. So there is um, a lesbian couple in this book, and they're not a main focus in the book. They're just... But it's not as annoying as, like, more from Akatar was. 
Um, whereas like it felt shoehorned in like this was, it's hard to explain it without explaining it. It was like layered in slowly. And then when you find out, you're like, oh, that makes sense. Um, I also don't like the terms male and female for like man and woman instead. However, I have noticed that in paranormal that is used a lot. Um, like I've read a lot more, um, paranormal in the last couple of months. And I, that is not something that is like exclusive to Sarah J. Mass. It's done in books by Cressley Cole. It's done in Neilani Singh books. It's done in, um, in other paranormals that I've read. So that's just how it is. It's annoying sometimes. I tried, but I just couldn't get into this. I did not like the writing style. Fair. Like this is so fair. I was warned by so many people that the first half of this book would be really hard to get through. And I'd agree with that. I was listening to this on audio. I had it on 1.7 speed. And for the first half of the book, I was listening to just like about an hour of it a day. And then I reached the tipping point where I finished it all within two days. So I think that that's fair. You know, I'm feeling fair when people say it's like too long or they couldn't get into it but I liked it. <laughs> Here's a funny one. Five ingredients of insect success. Number one, world. Up shapeshifters, vampires, fays, and angels, probably with a council of each, angels rule. Two, protagonist, half-breed, with a secret. Three, trigger, gruesome murder of the best, 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 best friend. <laughs> Four, love interest, very, very, very scary angel. Should constantly remind the public how scary he is. He throws lightning at will, has a skull cap, and could be named Winged Death or something on this line. He also should have a badass dog name like Ajax, Brutus, or Hunt. <laughs> Number five, budding romance. Snapping, snapping, snapping at each other, probably having hot sex at the end. If you have all of these, you do not need to create 3D characters or write a captivating story. The public will surely love you. Okay. I don't think that's true, but that one was funny. So cheers to you. <sighs> that was a lot. Okay. I think I've tortured myself enough. <laughs> My cheeks are getting rosy. Um, I need to take another allergy pill and I'm tired. So I'm going to end this here. I hope you found some value in this. I know it was kind of strange, but I've seen other people do it and I thought it would be fun. Um, sorry, some of those are maybe more rambling than normal, but anyway, thank you so much for watching this. Let me know if you agreed with any of those. <laughs> Let me know if you have some defense for any of those books. Um, and you know, these are five of my favorite books. I know I just read a, a lot of like not fun stuff about them, but I love them. So you should check them out <laughs> sometime. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I put up new videos three to four times a week and you can watch some more of them right now. Bye.